Welcome to Embedded. I'm Elysia White, alongside Christopher White. Our guest this week is Alex Glow, and we're going to talk about making projects, all kinds of projects. Hi, Alex. Thanks for joining us. Hey, what's up? Could you tell us about yourself as though we met for the first time in the alleyway of the Supercon conference? <laughs> uh, sure. So I would probably be bouncing around a bit, so just kind of imagine that. Uh and I would say, hey, I'm Alex Glow. I'm, uh, I, oh boy, I would definitely stumble over it. So this is very realistic. <laughs> um, I do the video channels for Hackster.io, which is a community, an online community for hardware developers to share their projects and do contests and things. So what I do is run our video channels. So I build projects, I write up tutorials, I teach people how to use new and cool technology and tools, and I also get to interview cool people like you, <laughs> but on another day, maybe. Maybe another day. It might be fun. <laughs> And I introduced you as Alex Glo, but it's Ale- actually Glowowski. Glowowski. Yeah. Maybe you should so, say. Sure. Yeah. Everyone thinks it's a stage name, uh, and I get that question fairly often. Like, so the Glow is just a shortened version of Glowowski, which is the anglicized version of Glowatsky, which is his Polish name. Um, and some people call it like Glowacki instead. I'm I'm kind of glad we went with the S instead. But I don't know. I could have been Alex Wacky instead. Who knows? I like the fact that it's glow and ASCII. I mean, that just, that so represents what you do. It's perfect. Yeah, it's kind of perfect, right? Okay, so let's do lightning round where we ask you short questions and we want short answers. And if we're well behaved, we won't ask you why and how and all those things. <laughs> Christopher, you want to go first? Yes, I will go first, and I will cover the fact that I'm scrolling around the document by talking. Okay. <laughs> if, if you were building an IoT stuffed animal. What dev system would you use? What dev system? Okay. So I'm sure we've all seen, I've definitely seen my share of IoT stuffed animals that were very creepy. <laughs> and <laughs> while that's sometimes a goal, it's usually not. Um, so there's like, you know, physically creepy and conceptually creepy, right? So I think that a lot of the things that IoT stuffed animals would be doing, like, for example, that German one, I forget what it was called, but they found out that, you know, it was really hackable. And so people could speak through it and say creepy stuff to your kids or like hear what your kids and like basically spy on you and stuff. And that's always suboptimal. So with things like that, I would always opt for something that is not internet connected or or, and or that you have full control over. So there's a couple of systems like uh, Mycroft and Snips.ai that are very privacy-focused vo- versions of things like Google Assistant and Alexa that basically make it so that you can fully control you know, what it accesses. You can maybe even run it offline. You can set up your own uh, wake words. So like instead of, you know, Mycroft or whatever, you could say Jarvis or whatever. <laughs> um and so I'm actually looking at building, not a stuffed animal, but um, a, a differently designed kind of interface for that. In fact, that's what Archimedes is, my robot owl. Um, so he doesn't talk to the internet at all. Uh, and he uses Google's AIY vision kit to do some cool little AI um, sort of emotion detection stuff. But if you're, I would probably make like some kind of stuffed animal and put either Snips or Mycroft in it in order to... Uh, uh, have it like assist me with things like maybe language learning or something. Okay, so for the second lightning round question. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, fast. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, that was fantastic. Your I, questions I, are we'll, too good. We'll, we'll circle back all around. <laughs> yeah, and we're definitely going to talk about the robot owl. How could we not? Yeah. Uh, but I do have another question, sort of in the same vein. If you were building a camera to monitor a 3D printer in your home, oh yeah, what sort of system would you use? Well, so I actually have a 3D printer in my home. Huge shock there. <laughs> and I use, um, I have an M3D micro printer and it, uh, can be run off of Octopi. So there's this Raspberry Pi system. It's an image you can download that basically lets you run, um, 3D printers off of a Raspberry Pi. And that way you don't have to leave your computer connected to it. And it even has a little, um, option where you can just plug in a camera to your Raspberry Pi and use that. So I'd probably go with that. Cool. Is that what you use, Christopher? Uh Uh-huh. Nice. If you were going to a classroom of second graders, what boards Mm. would you take? 
Well, the microbit, uh, the BBC microbit is a, uh, a board that has a five by five LED grid and an accelerometer, and like it can talk to each other via radio, and you can program it with like block programming. It's kind of based on this other one called the Code Bug. That's an even sort of like cuter, sort of bug shaped version with a little uh, uh, clip on, you know, places you can clip on alligator clips and stuff. So those would both be good choices, uh, or Little Bits, which is like a sort of Lego for electronics. They've been having kits, the little bits. They've been uh-huh. having just the most adorable kits with Star Wars. I saw they have a collaboration with Korg where you can build a synth. Yeah, it's like, what? that was really neat. That's so cool. A little expensive, but so cool. Uh, last one in the style of question. If you were going to make a car-sized fighting robot, <laughs> what dev system would you take? Mm, I would definitely <laughs> still want that to not be internet controlled. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's the last could go thing wrong. I need. <laughs> Ooh, boy. Um, hmm. So I actually contemplated, no, nah, I contemplated doing like a smart car system based on an Intel Edison, but that was like years ago. Let's see what I do now. Um, maybe, maybe I would use the Novena. Uh, so the Novena or Novena, I'm not sure how you say it, but by Bunny Huang, is this totally DIY laptop system that's designed to be completely open source to the point that like you build the case and everything, and it's got this uh, this uh, configurable array called the uh, Peak Array after Nadia Peak. Um, so you can sort of screw things in wherever you want, and so maybe taking that to kind of a maximalist viewpoint where you would turn it like not into something that's small and portable, but just like outfit it with, you know, you've got tons of space. You could put everything open source on there. It'd be like, you know, super, I don't know. It'd be really cool. <laughs> All right. What does YOLO stand for? <laughs> you obviously love owls. That is the, exactly. correct, that is the correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> Questionable content much. <laughs> Do you have a tip everyone should know? Yeah. So this is one that I always get asked, but I always forget about this most important one, which is that if you're doing something with electronics on a table, uh, especially with like lots of little screws and stuff, even if you're using one of those little mats where you can put all the components and stuff, just wear a skirt or like wear an oh, yes, or a kilt or something. Oh, so true. The amount of times that has saved me from having to crawl on the floor hunting for something that I dropped, like, oh my god. Totally. Or surface mount soldering, you know, all those tiny little things. Yes, when they fall in your lap, they're really easy to find if you have a skirt on. (laughs) It's so good. (laughs) Life hacks. Hashtag. All right, I have to buy some skirts. Seriously. Uh, Okay, so, so let's get to owls, because I know everybody out there is like going, owls? Tell me about the owls. <laughs> uh, you have a robot owl. You mentioned that in AI Y Vision. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, tell me. So uh, AI Y stands for DIY AI. It's a system created by Google to basically make it easy for people to mess around with arti- artificial intelligence. And they do. So... It's this cute little cardboard kit that you put together, a little box that has, and this, there's a voice version and a vision version. The vision version comes with a little um, camera and an activity LED and um, a little piezo buzzer for audio feedback, as well as a little light up button that sort of shows you the status and you can hit the button and... Uh, take a picture and it runs on Python. So I, they sent us one of these and I was introducing it to the hackster community. So I put together the kit and then I was like, well, for Maker Faire, we should make something really cool with this. Right. And I was like, I'm going to make something that gives away stickers. I'll just cut to the cool part. Basically (laughs) a bunch of stuff happened. And then I decided to make it into a um, 3d printed owl robot on a servo gimbal. So, uh, you know, a pan and tilt gimbal, it can sort of look around and stuff. So in one of his eyes is the camera and in the other eyes, eye is the piezo speaker. Uh, And then since I couldn't fit the button in his head as well, because it's kind of a big arcade button, uh, I made a little top hat for him as well that's 3D printed. And so all of this you can sort of download and mess around with. I've been tweaking the design a bit, but um, basically he sits on my shoulder thanks to something that my friend Mohib said, where he basically assumed that was going to be the case. I was like, sure, 
obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Duh. Uh, and so he sits on my shoulder and like looks around to find faces and stuff. And then he like figures out if he thinks they're happy or sad and like makes little beep boop noises <laughs> to show whatever emotion he thinks you are. And his little hat sort of lights up with uh, blue for sad and yellow for happy. Um, and so he's really cute and I run his servos off of a separate system. Right now it's an Arduino Maker 1000. So that, uh, you know, at any given point, probably something's broken. So either his, you know, AI part or his motors are working. Uh, and he's kind of fun for people to like interact with and stuff. But oh man, there's so many, so many more plans with that. I've recently replaced the Arduino for the motor control with a uh, Raspberry Pi that responds to this system called Chirp. It's an audio protocol. Tell me if I'm going on way too long about this. No, but, we're, uh, we're, we're quiet because we're fascinated. Keep going. Great. So Chirp.io is this system where you can control, uh, you can communicate between electronic devices using audio. More specifically, using something that sounds like R2-D2 noises. Oh, wow. Uh, yes. Oh, finally. <laughs> so you don't need Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or anything like that, um, any kind of internet connectivity. You just need, you know, the app on your phone or like a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino or something that can uh, you know, send or receive the messages, uh, and you can hear it yourself. It goes like, oh, I could, I could play something from it. Maybe if I can get that working. But um, so now he had, I programmed some little animations that he can do where he, you know, you play him a little owl and then happy emoji. So it can send, you know, Unicode emoji as well, which is amazing. So I send him like <laughs> owl and happy and he'll do this like little sort of weird fake laugh that looks really awkward and creepy right now. <laughs> or like owl and sad. And he does a little sort of like, you know, droopy head, like, like sort of shakes his head side to side as though he's super despairing. Um, and then I can send him a cheese emoji and he stands up straight for a picture. Because <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> yeah, all, like the thing about having an animated pet, right, is that you take him to conventions and things and people are like, oh, can we get a picture? And he's like looking off somewhere in the distance or like down at my right. feet or something like that. Yeah. And he never stands still, so I have to like unplug him and like manually turn him that way, which is really bad for his motors and really stressful for me. And this way will just be so much better. I'm glad this is the pre-holidays or, or the holidays episode, because I am coming up with a great list of things that I want to do while we're off and that oh, I will yeah. need more gear for. And they all involve owls? <laughs> well, no. I mean, I like owls, but... It would be an octopus. Come on. <laughs> oh, yeah. And that's a great thing. You can adapt the platform to all kinds of different things, you know. Well, and I like hearing about Chirp.io because I, I'm doing an underwater thing and, and it actually has an acoustic modem and I just want to hear it. And I'm what? waiting I'm waiting to get an acoustic modem so I can hear what it it's, actually sounds. Yeah, it's going to sound like a modem. Yeah, it's going to sound like an old stop modem. I should hear ear, 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 ear. <laughs> Oh, man. There was this, um, there's that person who does the Floppotron array of floppy drives that they cause mm -hmm. to make music yeah, yeah, with yeah. the stepper motors. <laughs> they did one, they did Bohemian Rhapsody and they actually threw in an old school modem there with some little solos. <laughs> oh, we'll have to find that. I haven't seen Sweet. that. <laughs> it's super good. You, so we now have gone through a whole bunch of different processors, a bunch of interfaces. How do you, how do you learn all this stuff? I mean, I, I know the STM32 line, I know the TX2, but this is a lot of stuff. Yeah, so um, a lot of the stuff I don't get to learn in great depth. So I'm constantly sort of like having to get up, um, sort of bone up on new technologies and new boards and things. And a lot of the time, to be honest, I'll like, you know, read up on it, make a video about it. If it's something kind of niche, like... A 3D magnetic IMU sensor that's specifically for automotive applications or something like that. I'll learn a bunch of stuff about it enough to do a video and then I'll kind of like, it'll, my brain will wander off in other directions. But there's some that just are so versatile and so useful and have great community support that they keep coming back up. And obviously, since it's like a big part of my job, then that's how I have the time to learn a lot of that stuff. Like I learn it like it's my job because it's my job, you know? <laughs> um, but, 
Also, this is just fascinating. I kind of assumed that if my job became just electronics, that I would end up doing no electronics in my free time. But that's not the case. I do lots of other stuff, but like, I still、um, happily spend evenings doing that. Which is kind of good because my schedule is super weird. Like the best thing about my job, honestly, is flexibility.、Um, so I'll typically ro- roll in around like eleven in the morning and then leave at like seven or eight at night, or even later if I'm three D printing something. Because in the morning I feel like I'm able to do creative stuff, like I work on music or writing or something like that,、um, and then、uh, I sort of. Get myself prepared for the day and sort of woken up, and then I go in and start dealing with emails. Yeah, and then I, I do that sometimes, and then I have another creative spurt, kind of later in the afternoon, that I can apply to my job. But I, I've used my、oh, yeah. first one for my own stuff, which is what、mm-hmm. I care about. <laughs>、uh, I'd love to see what you work on. <laughs> <laughs> Although maybe you don't want to share, like. Maybe this is like your public thing, and then you have private projects that you don't talk as much about. I don't know. No, I'm pretty open about what I'm working on.、Um, I do、uh, some. I think they're called zines, but that's、oh, not、yeah. what I call them. I call them comics, and I try to do co- a technical one. So I've been working on taking one that I did about two years ago about Bayesian inference and math, and what it really、Whoa. means when we do when we talk about. Bayes rule,、um, and I wanted to also learn a new drawing program. So I took my mess- messy comics from then, and <laughs> I'm working on making really pretty ones now, or wow, less、so cool. messy ones. I regarding the zines versus comics thing.、Uh, I talked to. Do you know Doc Pop? He's a an SF guy who does like lots of Yo Yo stuff and lots of zine stuff, <laughs> but、uh, I asked him what's the difference between like a zine and a mini comic because that's what he calls his stuff. They're the little like you kind of fold a page into eight, you know, eight pages、yeah. or whatever. And I think his deal was that a zine is more sort of like a bunch of stuff cut and pasted, and a comic is more like single focus. But I think also it's like it's obviously not a super strict medium. That's kind of the point, right? Well, you've convinced me. I'm sticking with comic. Yeah, you do you. <laughs> Either way, <laughs> have you seen Sailor Mercury's stuff?、Mm-mm. Yeah. Oh. oh yeah. Who's that?、Uh, well, we haven't had her on, but、okay. maybe someday.、Um, you and I have seen her. Okay. She does the Electro Cuties jackets. Right. Right. Okay. Sorry. Yep. Yeah, and she does、um, some technical explainer zines. Like, there's one. Called How Does the Internet? <laughs> okay, I've seen、um, that one. Yeah, I just didn't,、yeah. didn't recognize the name. Well, <laughs> yeah, she goes by Sailor HG. And Julia Evans also has、right. a bunch of them. And so there's been this this idea that you can spread information amusingly. I love it, and I love it. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of that、um, Walt Disney quote. Even though he was kind of an,、uh, or should I say, he was kind of a jerk. <laughs> Kind of a huge jerk, <laughs>、uh, but、um, he did say something of value, which is、uh, this thing of I think I wrote it down somewhere. It's like I would rather entertain and hope that people learn something than educate people and hope they were entertained. Like the more that you can interweave, you know, like people don't want to read something super dry, or some people do, but you know, if well, sometimes you have you to, can, but if you don't have to, if you can,、yeah. if you can keep keep people engaged.、Uh, While you're educating them, that's definitely a, a bonus. And this idea that you don't have to be super formal or have the right background or education in order to be able to like share something of value,、um, yeah, super good. That actually、uh, leads me to a question that I kind of wanted to ask you. You don't have a double E degree, do you? No,、uh, no. I went to college and I was going to study linguistics. Um, then I realized that I just sort of wanted to learn languages, <laughs> so I did that. But、um, Spanish and Russian, if I if I saw, yeah, are, are there more? I, well, I also studied. I took an intensive、um, Mandarin Chinese course, but I wasn't able to go very far with that because I had other classes. <laughs> but yeah,、um, I majored in Spanish and I did the whole、uh, intensive Russian sort of course at the residential college, and that was awesome.、Uh, I've, but、uh, so yeah, no, no formal electronics training. I mostly learned through the hackerspace communities, and originally sort of through first robotics in high school. 
So how did you how did you go from I graduated with a Spanish degree to I'm full time learning how to do <laughs> hardware and present it? Yeah, well, so okay, so、uh, even in college, right? It's like your major doesn't define you. Like your job doesn't find you. Your your major doesn't define you. You don't have to stick with one thing. So even in college, I was doing things like、um, setting up my. You know, the university gives you a free server, and so I was sort of playing around with setting up a website on there and learning how to、um, mess around with、uh, VPSs, for example, like virtual private servers that we got some server space that we could do stuff with. And I was always, you know, fascinated by that. And I feel like if I weren't doing technology now, I'd be doing something else. But like,、uh, <laughs> you know, you, like you with the zines, you know, you're not limited to. Or pardon, comics. <laughs> but、um, and I think that that makes everything stronger. But to answer your question,、uh, after college, I sort of helped get off the ground this、uh, new hacker space in Ann Arbor called All Hands Active.、Uh, shout out to Aha、uh-huh. and. That was where I first learned how to use an Arduino and stuff like that. I started building this、uh, project out of an old Make magazine called the Five Dollar、uh, Cracker Box Amp, which was like an amplifier that you can build、yeah. into a Ritz Cracker Box. Yeah, and, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, and I was like, it's not actually five dollars if you get all the parts from、right. Arduino <laughs> Shack, but I also didn't build it into a Cracker Box. I just built it into some like. Uh, corrugated plastic or whatever, but、um, so you know, just gradually, sort of over the years, and it's very project based. So if you, I think a lot of people who get into software who don't do boot camps or formal training、uh, learn a lot through just having specific projects that they want to accomplish, and you always have to learn something to achieve something new, right? So、uh, you sort of build your skills gradually that way, and then.、Um, In, or, in terms of doing it professionally, so around that same time, two thousand nine, I started a blog where I was getting into. I decided that I, I had a bunch of free time, so I would try and make one project per week, and I was going to be taking notes along the way so that I could remember how to do this stuff. And in my head, I was like, "Oh well, I should just put this on the internet." Just because, like you know, if it's going to be my brain, I might as well like share this stuff with other people. It'll help me remember too. And kept doing that, and started giving talks about like my explorations with audio electronics and stuff. So people sort of just by, I think the most important thing was being able to do what you enjoy as work, if you choose to do that, is. To just do it when you have the time, with the motivation you have, and share the crap out of it, because that's how you spread the word that you're doing this stuff. And when someone is looking for someone who does the things that you do, like either for a speaker for a conference, and they want to pad out their roster or whatever,、um, they'll think of you, and that way you build your reputation, and you get to have more opportunities to cool do cool stuff. How do you share what you do? I mean now. Now you have Twitter followers and and YouTube followers and people know who you are, <laughs> but that that zero to being the person somebody thinks of to invite to a conference. How do you make that transition? A lot of that is about people, right? So、um, I was doing the blog, so that was there. And then if I met someone who was interested in one of the projects I was doing, either through the hacker space or whatever. Then、uh, I would say, "Oh, hey, you can look at my blog here."、Uh, I didn't really get on Twitter until a few years ago, but、um, when I did, I already had this sort of backlog of things I could talk to people about. But honestly, most of it is just in person. Like I would go to events where I was interested in what they were talking about.、Um, you know, the first step to being a speaker somewhere is to is to get into that community by going to the events, and so just by Nature of being interested in the stuff, I was、uh, attending, for example, at、um, I forget what it's called, like Ann Arbor Brew Tech or something. Doug Song, the、uh, founder of Duo Security, is a huge badass, total badass, doing really cool stuff.、Um, helped make the skate park happen in Ann Arbor, but、uh, he runs these events where you know makers can meet each other. And through the hacker space, you know,、um, Mitch Altman and Jimmy Rogers came through and taught、uh, some. Uh, a couple of workshops, and then there was a maker fair that got started in Detroit. So I met Del Doherty and Sherry Huss for the first time,、uh, as long as, as well as some other people, and just 
meeting the other people locally who were interested in doing that stuff. When they ran events, I would go to theirs. If we ran events, they would come to ours, etc. Um, yeah, it's all about people, right? If, the more you can meet them in person and just generally, genuinely share interests, uh, you know, you get each other stoked about what you're doing. <laughs> Uh, and that's totally what happens. Like, sometimes I go to an event and it feels like I'm just doing it out of obligation or whatever. Pretty rarely, but sometimes. But then I get there and it's like, oh my god, everyone's talking about stuff that I'm fascinated by. I went to this thing yesterday, um, a biohacking uh, sort of mini conference called Body Hacks West. And I had a horrible time getting there and I almost gave up because it was such a ridiculous day. But I went and... Uh, these people were talking about cerebral voice, which is a um, a system that lets you use subvocalization to control your devices. And I had just been talking with someone on the internet, on Twitter, about <laughs> uh, what the privacy implications of this technology would be, like if you can do it from afar. It turns out that anytime you read something, if you were if you grew up um, speaking uh, and hearing, then uh, you probably started learn to read by uh, speaking aloud and even grown-ups still ec- make extremely minute muscle movements when they read uh, as though they're reading aloud and you can detect that so you can use that to control devices and people who grew up not hearing uh, with sign language uh, will make minute hand movements hmm. uh, yeah and so I got to ask them this question about oh you know could this be used if someone has really high tech camera technology, you know, to sort of see what you're reading from afar, which would be kind of a huge, you know, vulnerability. And they said that the tech is like pretty far away from that right now, just because of the sensitivity that you need, even with on the skin contact. Still it's, 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 you know, that's a, that's a good thought to have that early. Right. I mean, a lot of people, that that's the thought that you have when when the problem starts to arise. <laughs> like, okay, now we can do. Oops. <laughs> yeah, I think that's why I think that's why you need such cross pollination, yeah. right? You have people who aren't domain experts but have tons of valuable, like they care about security or whatever, you know. So, with your projects that you do on your own before you, you th- became your job, how did you learn what you needed to? I, I you know, I like to learn. But sometimes I just wish I could matrix download stop, matrix download it and videos like don't work for me. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a reader and I totally get that not everybody is. But h- how do you do it? How do you stay engaged enough to get through the difficult part of learning? So I'm also much more reading focused, uh, kind of a dirty secret is that I actually, I don't learn by videos almost at all, unless it's something very specific and software based where you kind of have to see the person do it. But like, mostly I still learn through reading stuff as well. And the internet, honestly, like I, I can't imagine having this kind of a life before the internet, um, where you can just get instant answers to those little questions and stuff. Actually, now I'm getting more into in-person classes again because it seems like it's so hard to get to. So, you know, you'll get stalled out on a project, right? Um, and I often have a ton of different program- projects going at a time. And what will happen is that I'll hit kind of a wall or a stumbling block or something I can't get through in an evening in one. And the next day I'm off back into work or onto something else. Uh, and But then, you know, months later, I'll just find that missing piece and it'll slot into there. And that way, like, that thing will get wrapped up. And so um, a lot of it is happenstance, uh, sort of having a bunch of stuff going on at one time. And then you resolve sort of things as the solutions arise. But more specifically, um, if I have something in particular I really want to get... Um, worked out, I'll just read through forums. Like, Google all the error messages. Yeah. You know, just figure out everything that you can possibly... Uh, you know, my keyword game is, is amazing, right? I'm sure yours is as well. Or, like, you're just like, okay, I need to learn this thing. Uh, and then you sort of drill down into that. Recently, I needed to learn... Um, I'm working on this new project, The Glow Up, which is, like, an open-source version of this... Uh, basically a face-mounted sad lamp that you can use against seasonal affective disorder and jet lag. And uh, I needed to know a lot of stuff about that, like, you know, which wavelengths work and, um, you know, what 
how many lumens do you need? Uh, and does it even work? And how long do you have to wear it for? And what are the safety concerns with shining lights in your eyes and stuff, right? And all of that I was able to mostly jack from uh, companies that have recently started releasing these devices um, and learned a lot of other cool stuff along the way. But yeah, just, just Google, man. I'm just, anytime people complain about the internet, I'm like, don't you remember? We used to argue about stupid stuff. We just look up now. <laughs> yeah. And another cool thing, like, I'm not personally dyslexic, but the amount of the life change I've heard from friends who are, like, the way that the education system didn't serve them in the past, and the way that you're able to cram knowledge into your head now with audiobooks is ridiculous! Like, I got back into audiobooks because I was dating someone who had been, dis or was dyslexic, and then, like, this idea that you can listen to them, you can learn to listen to them on, like, 2x speed, if it's something that, like, I listen to fiction for fun, and I'll listen to that on a slower speed, but, like, if I want to cram into my brain something about, like, I'm, I don't know, <laughs> but there's all there's so much information available for free from the library in audiobooks that I can just have on my phone. I don't even have to go anywhere. It just like comes into my ears. That's amazing. Podcast too. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, totally. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> what is the hardest for you to pick up? Software, mechanical, hardware, keeping it working? I mean, these are all different disciplines. Mm. And they all require a different sort of thought process. Which one is yeah. the most natural for you and which is the hardest? I think the ma most natural stuff for me is mechanical, which kind of makes sense. I've been using my hands my like whole life, right? Um, and software is definitely the hardest. <laughs> software to me, it feels like quicksand, right? Like it looks solid and it's like it was solid six months ago. Like why... <laughs> wouldn't I be able to run this again now? And it turns out that I've changed something small in my development environment and like suddenly nothing works. I'm like, no. And like dependency trees or whatever you call them. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Like that, those are the death of me. Like that, so I can sort of muscle through an electronics project in an evening if I need to, but software, you can just sort of go down these deep, deep, deep rabbit holes where you have so many different factors. Like nothing exists in isolation, which I know that there's, I know there's like, you know, develop an environments and little sandboxes you can make that alleviate that, right? But and even maintaining that and remembering what I have on my computer when it's not like something I have mapped in my brain, because I don't have a map of the whole system that's set up on my computer. You know, if I need to know what version of Python or Node.js or whatever is installed, I have to go and check. And I know everyone else does too, but it's just not something that my brain does naturally which might be weird because you'd think the language stuff would help with that right but i think it's more of a state tracking thing i don't know the whole tools thing is a pain point yeah. for all of us i mean I yeah. been in the list. even people who are like software that's no big deal yeah, but you know the tools yeah that's a problem <laughs> yeah i did start uh go down a pretty cool rabbit hole a little while ago where i was trying to so like i know that the way that we visualize electronics is kind of backwards, right? Or electricity. Like, mm -hmm. when you say positive and negative, it's not that the electrons flow from the positive to the negative, even though that really is a helpful visualization for me, and it's really natural. So I tried to, like, be like okay, how does it actually work? The electrons, like, which is the cathode, which is the anode? And once you get there, that's pretty rough, because, like, the cathode on an LED is not the same sort of... Uh, it's not... So It's not the same... So. On an LED, the positive leg is, let's see, the, oh, I'm going to get this wrong, <laughs> is the anode, I think. And on a battery, it's like the opposite. So the, uh, I would, I've like, I've looked this up like four times and I know that it, I'm probably getting it wrong again, but like, I made this whole little uh, analogy with like, there being like an animal lizard <laughs> <laughs> and a cat on the other end of like a string and the animal is like trying to not get eaten by the cat so it like keeps throwing things at it and those are the electrons and so then cathode is the positive terminal and the anode is the negative and so like, you know, in a, on an LED, right, the cathode accepts the electrons the anode like spews them back out towards the battery, uh, but it's still not perfect. Maybe I was thinking about making a Xena about it eventually, <laughs> in fact, uh, but did not get that far. There's a book called Electronics for Earthlings Ooh. that tries to put 
electronics in this form. And they do some neat things with um, cars and bridges and traffic lights. And, you know, it, for, for the month after I read the book, it all made sense. Yeah. Oh, that'd be amazing. I'll totally check that out. Um, yeah. So spark fun, uh, sorry, says cathode is are negative and anodes are positive, but I totally get like batteries are the opposite and yeah, right. Electrons. I mean, thank you, Ben Franklin for lots of things, but our whole positive negative being backward, not a plus. And I yeah. do mean the pun. Well, and, and <laughs> one thing that kind of blew my mind when I was in school was everybody talks about electricity and, you know, things travel at the speed of light. And so you have this mental model of electrons blasting through a wire and, mm. and they don't. the signal trans no. goes at the speed of light or some significant fraction, depending on the material. But the electrons themselves are crawling if they're moving in much at all. Like I mm. think it's on the order of a few microns per second or something like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, when they draw those pictures and they show electrons, you know, zipping around, zipping around they're, they're, they're <laughs> barely doing anything. Oh, and then you can go in down those deep holes of like, once you get into like, well, why isn't it? And why is it that gravity is instant? You get into like gravitational waves and that's a whole bunch of other stuff that I don't know, but I would love to. Oh, there's not enough time to just like, to study everything, right? But you want to. You totally do. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I think that's a big factor of uh, nerds is that it's really hard for us to be bored because there's just always, always more rabbit holes to go down. You know that that's a good thing to say. We had uh, we had some guests over, and they are nerds, and they were kind of tired. And we had a weekend where we did not that much. We played games and and we hung out and we chatted, but the goal was to not find a project and start it. <laughs> and like three times, things happened, and I was like, "Oh, okay, we're going to start a project now." And we all looked at each other like. <laughs> Nope, back to the couch. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. yeah. When Chris came down with his uh with his synthesizers, I was like, oh, they're gonna be gone forever. <laughs> That's a trap too. Oh, I'm still not getting into modular synths because I know I'd instantly lose all my time and money. <laughs> oh boy. But yeah, that is so important though, being able to like lie fallow our our whole like our culture as much as everything else, uh, the nerd culture, um, especially with Twitter and everything is very focused on, you know, producing things constantly and having a presence. Constantly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of doing that professionally, like, you know, there's, there's gotta be space. You've got to have it be part of your values system that this lying fallow is a necessity. Like they do it for agriculture, right? You're supposed to leave fields to just kind of do their thing for a while. And it's good for the earth and it's good for your brain. Like, and while you're doing that, of course, like if you try to meditate and clear your mind, suddenly all these ideas come up. Um, and that's, you know, that's life. But you got to be able to let yourself detach. I totally admire that. You talk about, I mean, doing projects is part of your job and you do it at home. How do you make the differentiation between work and home? And then how do you make the space? that gives you time to recharge creativity? Mm. The short answer is I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm you're really lost because that. you are creative. <laughs> yeah, so um, my room, I'm looking around it right now, and there's a sewing machine on the thing, uh, on the, the table here right next to me, and there's like a bunch of random lamps that I made like over to the side and I'm like I think just I really enjoy being among it all the time even when I'm able to like keeping the space clean is super important right like just having it be kind of tidy and mine almost never is but that's when I experience the most sort of like peace and calm um but I also don't mind I think it comes in waves right you have waves where you're like super into doing stuff all the time and then I just had a week where I was like, I'm just going to chill. Uh, not necessarily on purpose. I, like, I felt like this urge to do stuff, but um, I naturally just kind of like leveled out. And um, I wish I could say that I cleaned my space in that time. And that's definitely a strategy that helps. But um, I think that as much as having downtime is important, so is just being able to switch gears. So... If I've been doing electronics all day, I'll come by or come home and uh, 
make something like I made these arm warmers with like some old tights and some nice soft black suede the other week. And that made me like so happy. Uh, and that, that feeling of just having to finish something small cather- carries you through. Yeah. So yeah. Right. Finishing things. Yeah. I and dig so it. I have, mm, so I have like some little projects. Like I just also made some, some fidget earrings, I call them, which is basically just some little metal bars that have these old, um, black pearls that I picked up in Ohio, like years ago. Uh, and you can slide the beads around on the metal rods and wear them on your ears. So you always have a little fidget toy. And that took like, you know, half an hour to make. And I did it half asleep. I was just like, I want this to be a thing. <laughs> and it was so refreshing. And I felt so sort of recalibrated, I guess, having made something tactile. That's why electronics and, and mechanical stuff is good for me. It's so tactile, you know? For me, it's writing and software. If I'm doing a lot of writing at work, a lot of technical writing, then I'm okay doing my own software projects for home. And if I'm doing a lot of software, like just producing software, then at home I want to do creative writing or or reading and thinking about creative writing. Mm. Because those are both things I really enjoy, but it it. One of them is only fun when I get to do it for me. And so yeah. it's, it, I do recharge by doing something. It's just doing something different and being able to do something small and different, accomplishable. Sometimes work yeah. doesn't feel accomplishable. Like it, yeah. there is no end. Email um, never ends. Email, you send it away, it comes back, it never ends. I hate email so much. But, you know, it's necessary. It lets us do cool stuff, right? Well, there's this this thing called decimation where you just delete nine emails, reply to the 10th, and delete nine more. Oh, my. It makes it go really fast. And you miss a lot of information, but if they (laughs) really cared, they would send it 10 times. (laughs) Is this like... No, this is not real. I've never done this. (laughs) I have always wanted to do this. Oh, yeah. But no, I've never. That's amazing. (laughs) Yeah. For recharging, I think, um, yeah, it's so important to be doing it just for yourself with no necessary timeline. Like, yeah, you want to, it's nice to, to do a small thing that you can finish easily. And that helps so much, but also just like, I stopped taking commissions because I can only have one big obligation in my life. It's nice to have deadlines to work to for other things, but only if they're like self-imposed. So, um, another thing that actually for me, music is really great because not only is it fulfilling creatively and you can like play a few songs in like 20 minutes or something, you know, but also the way that it physiologically, <laughs> the way that it physiologically um, sort of molds you. So when I play guitar and sing, for example, it sort of forces me to take really deep breaths and be mindful of my breathing in uh, a very purposeful way. Like I'm sucking in a ton of oxygen and pushing it back out and also sort of going through this um, laundromat of emotions or whatever, right? I think that songs are like shell scripts for this soul. You can sort of use them to go from one emotional state to another through like little tweaks or whatever, you know, through the story of a song. And the breathing as well that comes with singing is just like this very good way to sort of make sure that you're taking in a bunch of oxygen, feeling your feels and, and being an animal for a bit. Like you, you're, we forget that we're mammals, right? Yeah, I, I think that that's really interesting because uh, I've done a little bit of singing recently and I, I haven't done a lot and I'm not good at it, certainly. But uh, having to do some has kind of trained me or, or informed me that I'm really bad at breathing <laughs> like <laughs> because it's like, oh, well, this is, you know, this is an enforced form of breathing. You have to have the right breath to do this right. And I don't feel right after doing it. And it's like, oh, well. I wonder if I just don't know how to do this. So doing that actually yeah. was really kind of revelatory because it's like, oh, I, this is a normal kind of <laughs> thing you were supposed to be able to do right. But Yeah. And I had been singing for years before, like, I learned what breathing from the diaphragm actually is. And, like, right. and I was like, whoa, this is like magic. I can, like, <laughs> sing for <laughs> twice as long on a single breath. What? Uh, and harmonicas. Harmonicas make me feel that way because you have to control your breath on the way in and out. And I just don't have the capacity yeah. for that right now. I'm like, I can keep tro- control it, like, coming in and then, like, being used up. But not, like, timing. Uh, I don't know. 
I feel like harmonica has got to be a really special kind of uh, control that people have. <laughs> so what are you learning now? Are you engaged with something new and exciting to you or building mm. more depth in something that you've already learned? Definitely. I took a class in Ableton uh, about a week ago, actually, and I've been doing little doodles uh, on in the, com- in the program ever since. And that is incredibly empowering. So I always saw it as this kind of, I, I downloaded it years ago and tried, I was like, there's, oh, there's too many hotkeys. There's too many little boxes that I don't know what they mean and how all this stuff sort of goes together. And I knew that if I just sort of took a day to kind of learn all that stuff, then it would come together, but I didn't have whatever it took. So a six hour class was like the perfect format for that because you just get introduced to what a scene is, what a track is, what a clip is, and how do you, how these things work together. And like just little stuff, like how you get this type of uh, an instrument into this kind of a, like so that you can use it right with a keyboard. Yeah. And uh, there's this great organization in uh, in the Bay called Women's Audio Mission, and they had some really cool young interns, and like everyone in the class was super awesome. Uh, and I just left feeling like I had gone from zero, despite banging my head against it, to like feeling like I could could wizard something up in like a little while and something basic. But I have like like I'm I'm able to teach myself how to make drum loops now and like actually be able to use that and. It feels so empowering. So because when I thought you said you took a course in Ableton, that that was some location, (laughs) uh, (laughs) maybe, I I think maybe people are getting that it's a music uh, composition and arrangement software. Yeah. It's right. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) So I have some uh, really good friends who are musicians and (laughs) musicians, pardon, and, uh, I was able, I didn't want to like prevail upon one of them for like, you know, a huge course or whatever, but now I'm able to ask them questions about how they use it and stuff. So Ableton, I asked my friend this actually, like, I was like, is it a DAW? So DAW stands for Digital Audio Workspace or work something or other. (laughs) Workstation, I think. Workstation. Mm. And apparently Ableton was not designed as a DAW. It's more for live performance. But also, it's comparable to Pro Tools, which is another sort of like really sort of full featured recording, editing, and also synthesis. So you can pull in um, synthesizers and uh, plug in like a little USB keyboard in my case, or anything up to, you know, a full fledged MIDI controller of different types. There's ones that are shaped like guitars and like, like, um, Imogen Heap's Mimu gloves or like a glove. Yeah. Interf- yeah, so you can like plug that in, and then you Ableton is what the Mimu gloves talk to to trigger different types of loops, or you can hook different um, gestures up to certain effects like reverb, or um, you know, or delay or whatever, uh, or other effects like a filter that makes you sound like you're yelling down a tube. <laughs> um, Uh, And so that's where you can really shape your sound and also generate new sounds uh, by composing them with a MIDI controller and, or just your computer keyboard, honestly, and one of the instruments they have in there. So it basically makes my whole, uh, I've always, no, for like maybe 10 years, I've been doing music with like a guitar and voice and or mandolin or sometimes piano. And uh, I feel like uh, I've always wanted to be able to add in things like drums, which I can't play, uh, or be able to edit things together more intensely so that, for example, I can make it sound better or I can add effects and things. And uh, now I feel like I have the power. I have the, the sort of grasping, the starting grasping point, whatever you would call that. Yeah. It's nice to be able to get the independence to do the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, so I want to go back to ha- Hackster.io. Uh, um, how is it different from Hackaday.io, where people put up projects or instructables? What is mm, Hackster.io? Yeah. So uh, I will admit that I had done an instructables rend- res- residency before. And when I first heard about Hackster, I was like, this seems like instructables. But... Um, and I think Hackaday.io wasn't around uh, yet at that time. So what 
drew me in was the fact that it has these ties to the companies that make the electronics. Uh, and while it is not a corporate platform, it's very much sort of community driven. Um, each company that makes tools for uh, electronics builders or developers, for example, Arduino or Raspberry Pi or Microsoft or Samsung or Intel or whoever, um, or even uh, you know 3D printers or software people, they have their own hubs on Hackster. And so you can go to the Raspberry Pi page and see all the Raspberry Pi projects on there. And you can funnel down by like individual products and stuff that they produce. So like, I have a Pi Zero W. And so I can see what I can build with that. And so it's a huge inspiration engine in that way. Plus, um, I'll, most of how we're funded is those companies, you know, using their hubs, they can embed them in their sites. So if you look at Arduino.cc, for example, and you go to the project area, that's just Hackster with a skin on it. So um, we have these, you know, th- we can support ourselves that way, which means that there's much less in terms of advertising or whatever, even though there's this close relationship with the companies. And we're able to do uh, a lot because of that, which is really cool. But um, I think that that integration with the companies and the ability to really easily search for how to use one particular thing with another particular thing. Uh, it's really sort of discovery and exploration based, which I love. And you get a lot of contests too. Yeah. So we're doing right, one right now called Badge Love, which is about the sort of PCB badge explosion that's happened where everyone's excited to make uh, artful circuit boards, which is something that, you know, has been around for a while with like bold port and things like that. But uh, it's really having kind of a a huge cultural moment right now. And so we're doing a col- uh, band has <laughs> doing a contest around it. And that's actually what I wanted to build the glow up for the sad slash jet lag glasses thing, because I thought that we could make something that looks beautiful, but also provides use to people in the winter right now, or, you know, if they're at a conference that they traveled to from far away, it can actually be something that you don't just like leave in your drawer or whatever. I'm, I'm somewhat baffled by the badge thing, but (laughs) I, I know many people who are doing awesome badges for reasons I still don't understand, but respect. I think uh, the, it's, uh, they're pretty and they're interesting and talking to the toy makers about the complexity of their badges. Yeah. Oh my God. It's so cool. <laughs> it is very cool. And yet I, I, I don't know that that's how I'd spend my time, but that's cool. Yeah. That's totally I think cool. it's a kind of, yeah, I think it's a kind of two way thing, right? Where like, so people who have those skills, but have never really felt like they could express themselves artistically, uh, are finding that they have this medium available to them where they can put those skills to use in a way that lets them express themselves and like show their like enthusiasm for Mr. Robot or for Futurama or whatever. Uh, and not to say that people who do PCV art don't do art in other ways, but like, I feel like if I had all these hardware skills, uh, and I wanted to, to express myself somehow people think that they need to have like an art degree or like go learn to use paint brushes or something like that in order to make art and maybe that's part of it also for me like i coming from the other side where i don't have those skills yet this gives me kind of an inroad where like people are suddenly publishing these tutorials on how to make really cool looking ones and that's totally like i love shiny things uh and i love you being able to um produce things that are beautiful, right? And so it sort of gives me this motivation to... uh, I started designing my own set of, like, modular tech jewelry PCBs called Charmware, uh, just as a way to understand how to make PCBs and develop that skill in a way that isn't super dry and boring. Uh, And so that's the value that it has for me. And that makes sense. I I tend to shy away from making PCBs (laughs) and... And so this, it makes a lot of sense that that is a way for the PCB people to, to really show off what they're doing in a physical medium. I get that. So I'm actually so cool. Is there, um, like what, what if you could do like a, no, well, I was going to say, what if you could do like a PCB comic or whatever, but clearly you're happy. Like not everything has to be technological and not everything has to be, uh, electronic. That's definitely a thing. Well, if I was going to do one, I would use the off, an off-the-shelf PCB and then coat it in plastic and then 
write some weird software for it because uh-huh. software is where I'm at. Yeah. Um, and if I wanted to put together a little IMU and a magnetometer and a light and a little processor, I could do a million cool things with that and wear it around my neck like a necklace. Yeah, the level to which they're still called badges is a little ridiculous. Like, I got this yeah. one from Spectra that's like an entire computer. <laughs> like a yeah, if you screen. took it back to the 80s, people would... <laughs> which yeah. burn them at the stake. What is this alien technology you brought? <laughs> oh, it's a conference badge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, now you have like a separate badge and like another badge. So it's yeah. sort of like not obviously not really the badge anymore, but like whatever. <laughs> So at Hexter.io, there are a whole bunch of channels, and you're a moderator on many channels, and you have videos on some channels. Where do I, where do I get started as somebody who has never been to Hexter.io? I, I log in, I see some projects that are interesting, but it's, it's too much. Where do, I, where do I find you, and how do I figure out how to take it at a pace I can understand? Mm, yeah, so uh, you mentioned the channels, and... Uh, if you, it depends on sort of your level and your interests. So, for example, if you're, uh, I know that you have experience, but if one were coming from a position of like wanting to get started with making in general, we get a lot of people who are like, I don't know how to do electronics, but I want to learn. So, there's like a hardware 101 channel where I've done a bunch of like tutorials to sort of get people up to speed on what the components are, what the basic boards are, and what an Arduino is, etc. cetera. Uh, and then, or if you are into it, like if you're into robotics or home automation or wearable tech, whichever sort of angles you're coming at it from, because it's a medium, right? Not necessarily an, an interest in itself, although that's definitely true. Um, but everyone's coming at it from their own sort of interest areas. So you can uh, join the AI community or join the vehicle hacking community, or for me, it's bikes as well. Um and that way you'll get projects sort of sent to you that are new things that people are publishing in those veins. Or if you look at your toolbox and you're like, mm, I have, you know, two of this type of Arduino and then like, um, oh, what else would people be working with? Suddenly my brain is like toast. <laughs> uh, or like two Arduinos and a Raspberry Pi. Then you would could go to those specific product pages and look at what people have been building with those and sort of cross-reference and be like, oh, here's a thing that I could build right now. Or you can follow us on the social media stuff, which I can't look at because then I end up with 80 tabs open and zero minutes left in my life. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. Um, or you can just go to hextra.io slash video and then you'll see all the things with my face on them <laughs> if that's a thing you wanted to do. But... Um, I, I like to think that we keep it pretty interesting. I get the uh, sort of flood thing, though. That's a big thing that we tell people who are trying to launch a new product. Uh, often they'll say that you can build anything with it, and that's honestly just overwhelming. Not helpful. You, gotta yeah. Give a, yeah. Yeah. You, can, you can do What do I do with it? You can do anything. Well, <sighs> you need a starting point, yeah. C- constraint I, is helpful. <laughs> that's one of the good things about the contests. Is even if you don't yeah. participate to win it gives you boundaries and then you can mm. start going from there. Totally agree. What, like, what would you want to build right now? Are you building any electronics? Um, I have this typing robot that, <laughs> uh, that has a really, really cheap uh, robotic arm, like $50 me arm and a really expensive brain, the TX2. Mm. And a camera that is not fixed. You can move the camera wherever you want. And I probably need another camera because I need depth. Uh, but my goal is to overcome the limitations of exceedingly crappy mechanics with <laughs> fancy, <laughs> fancy software. Uh, oh, that's great. So yeah, that's, I'll- it's, it's fun. Um, and it depends. And right now, most of my job involves. A lot of that, including the robot operating system. So I haven't been working as much on my typing robot because I'm using everything I learned from my typing robot in my paying job, Wow, <laughs> which nice. is pretty cool. I didn't, I wouldn't have gotten this job if I hadn't spent so much time playing with my typing robot. I love that. Do you have a name for it? Uh, Ty, Typey Epty. Uh-huh. Uh, That's great. Yeah. I, I, he's he's really great and he's fun and he's ridiculous and there's so much failure. It works just badly enough to be <laughs> comical. Yeah, I remember I told him to type hello and he typed help, 
And I was writing the video at that time. And I'm like, that is perfect. I really couldn't have asked for that to go any better. Oh, man. Wait, how do you, um, how do you talk to it, him? Oh, well, I did put uh, speech recognition on, which mm. again, doesn't work well enough to be working, <laughs> but works well enough to look like it occasionally works. Uh, so I can talk to him that way. Um, but mostly I, I type and say, type hello. And, and on a different keyboard, it types hello. That's awesome. What uh, system? Oh, you said the TX too. Yeah. Yeah. So it's Linux based and uh, a lot of OpenCV and um, AI stuff. Mm, are you using Pocket, the Pocket Sphinx for the speech recognition? Or? I am using Pocket Sphinx. For, nice. Yeah. And when you say dinosaur, it gets like stop sign. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it, it it works. It works not good, and that is fine with me. I kind of like not good. Yeah, like our community's movements are super, super sort of jerky. They're not very naturalistic, but it's also kind of shy and cute in that way. Oh my god! Yes, I did this mode where uh, it's a camera and a la- you ha- you have a laser, and the robot <laughs> follows the laser no like a cat. Way. And it even wiggles its butt as though it's going to pounce. <laughs> it was, and the jerkiness of it is so cute. Do you have videos of this up? Oh yeah, I do. Oh, I have I whole project pages. I'll send them to you. Oh yeah, <laughs> I need to do my research. That's oh, that sounds great. How long have you been building it? Uh, let's see. Him. I guess last year was when you spent a lot of time on it. Eighteen months ago was the first time I I I presented him at, at uh, yeah. LA's. Um, hack space. Crash space. Mm, yeah, crash that space. That place is great. And the Pasadena uh, lab. Super cool. Uh, was that like for an event? Did you have a deadline or were you just like, I'll, I'll make it and bring? We were in the area. so We were going to be in the area and I know uh, the Hackaday people pretty well. So I said, hey, I'm going to be in the area and I want to present this thing. And they said, okay, sure, let's do something. <laughs> And so they let me come and we did one of their evening talks. And I don't, That's somebody was cool. going to talk after me. And then afterwards he was like, yeah, I'm not going to talk after that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> I mean, that's a great sign for you. Did you still get to like talk about what they were doing or? Yeah, no, well, he, he, he kind of, uh, he did talk to the people who were interested, but, mm. uh, I was also sitting in the front of the room talking to people who wanted to play with my robot, which was fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm all for that. That's my favorite part of talks is like the the hangout with people afterwards. I, mostly, I like I like speaking a lot, mm. uh, and I'm pretty shy in person. I know that on the podcast it's weird to say that, but I'm sitting at <laughs> home in front of my computer, pretty much in my jammies. Yeah, and uh, when I go to a conference, I have to be on, and I'm I, you know, when we hang up with you. I, I will probably go back to the couch and finish reading like murder bot diaries or something silly. Wait, is that a thing? Oh yeah, it's totally a thing. What? <laughs> it's Wait, a, who's this by? Uh, Martha Wells. Uh, she won a couple of awards for it. I think it won the Hugo Novella Award this year or last year. No way. That sounds amazing. It is. It's. It is very cute. Um, yeah, it's too short. That's the killer part. But yeah, I have to go start the next one <laughs> <laughs> cool. but at conferences you, you hang out and you're there and i only extrovert for about an hour at a time <laughs> i feel very similarly i gotta recharge after yeah and then i just want to nap mm. that's super good yeah. i wanted to play you a quick chirp message oh, yeah, just so you can see oh, what yeah. it sounds like okay so this uh i won't tell you what it says <laughs> i'll try to <laughs> decode would- it if you download the Chirp <laughs> Messenger app, or if you get it set up on a device, then you can totally you could have um, uh, was it Ty, uh, yeah. decode it for you. <laughs> so here it comes. It's kind of loud. Uh, okay. There you go. Doesn't it, isn't it super R two D two? That is very <laughs> cool. Is it dense enough that you could learn it? How many characters was that? That was, um, so I actually wanted to know if I could like slow it down so I could just like hum or whistle it to him. Yeah. I don't think it can be produced or understood by humans yet, like in its current form, but mm, that'd be cool. Wouldn't it? So, right. <laughs> so this is 10, 12 characters. 
right now. Okay. So it's fairly, it's not like the most blindingly fast protocol, but it's really cool, and you don't have to have any internet connection to do it. I'm really a fan of like that kind of stuff, you know, where you and you now, don't yeah, have to, yeah. yeah, it works off grid or whatever. Now I'm thinking about having multiple conversations at the same time, and could could you layer them so that it could pick out what was directed? You're at... gonna do DTMF uh-huh. with chirp? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> DTMF. Is it? Oh, no, spread spectrum, not DTMF. DTMF is the button phone sound, buttons. the phone buttons. Yeah. No, this would be uh, spread spectrum where you're trying to yeah. interleave information. Yeah. We've been keeping you talking for a long time, and I feel like we have a lot more to talk about. I know, right? I want to, like, I feel like I've been talking a lot, and I would, I, I could just listen to stuff from you folks, like, forever. <laughs> but you know what's great is that you have a whole website where you post you all talking about stuff for ages and ages, so I can just go listen to that now. That's great. 270 episodes. <laughs> Dang! Congrats! <laughs> oh, yeah, I was gonna ha- Oh, no, I already asked you, like, how long have you been working on your robot? Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, that's so cool. Hopefully I'll get to work on it more next year, too. Uh, yeah. Okay, so just a couple more questions, and then we'll we'll let you go. Cool. Do you have any projects that you really like, especially projects that maybe have gone unnoticed? Ooh, actually. So uh, speaking of what we just said about um, things that don't necessarily have to be online or whatever or work off grid. So I made this project for DefCon, but it turned out to not be used at DefCon, partly because there were some technical issues, partly because there was confusion, but it's called PyPFS. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with IPFS, but it's a, uh, it stands for the Interplanetary File System, and it's a, don't hate me, blockchain-based, okay, that's over with, <laughs> it's a blockchain-based, um, <laughs> uh, sort of like an alternative internet. And so, for example, it's been used, um, it's sort of like a peer-to-peer internet where anyone can store the files and it's very secure because each file's address is made of a hash of its contents. So if you change the contents at all, obviously it has a different address, so you can't like spoof that. And it's been used, for example, to provide uh, access to Wikipedia in Turkey. They mirrored it onto the IPFS uh, when it was banned there by the government. So people were still able to get this info either from, you know, a public server that was sharing these files or people can get it from each other. Um, and the way... It, so, yeah, it's a really cool thing. Um, it's started by Juan Benet, and he has a really cool few talks about it. And I built this into a Raspberry Pi. I wanted to make a mobile... IPFS uh, terminal interface thing. So it's made out of Lego. It's got uh, interaction via arcade buttons on the sides, but you could also like plug in a wireless keyboard if you wanted more uh, intense interactive capabilities. But I wanted this to be sort of self-contained and not super hackable because DEF CON. Uh, so it um, basically allows you to look at different files on the IPFS, pull them up, and then you can print them with a little thermal printer and take this little like piece of IPFS with you. Uh, and so I was really excited about that. I thought it was cute because it's like made of Lego and laser cut acrylic and stuff. And uh, I actually had design had to design three new Lego pieces to to build it. So there's one big block that holds like an arcade button and stuff. Uh, and I also just really wanted to share the idea that blockchain can be used for things that really affect people's lives and has these applications that aren't just sort of cryptocurrency pyramid schemes and stuff. Uh, and I've, I think this one does have a lot of potential usefulness for people. Uh, and so I, I had hoped that would get more attention, but also it didn't really work out at the event where it was supposed to be sort of a showpiece. So maybe there'll be another event in the future where I can sort of bring it out and be like, Hey, look at this thing. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that would be really exciting. And you have it well documented. I like the idea of a a Lego piece that you can attach to a gu- guitar strap. Oh, yeah. That's that was neat. really fun. Okay. Now I have to go read this, so we should stop talking because it's rude when I, I read while guests are still talking. Um, <laughs> so, Alex, do you have any thoughts you'd like to leave us with? I guess just um, this idea that you don't have to be this idea that you don't have to be formally trained in something to explore it uh, or to be able to share something of value on it. There's so much imposter syndrome 
and that never goes away. Like, I feel like I've, I've gotten over a lot of it simply by hearing people that I admire incredibly much um, talking about how they have imposter syndrome. Like, when I did the Autodesk residency, um, we had this dinner to welcome in the next cohort, and people gave their thoughts, sort of one takeaway from their own residency, and several people in that room said that the biggest thing that blew their mind was that, like, they got to hang out with these people who were doing incredible stuff, who had these amazing skills, uh, and were just making this huge contribution. And the people saying that were people that I thought, like, felt that, I felt that same way about them. And I thought that they were doing, like, such amazing stuff that was, like, so impressive. Like, this person came in who was, uh, I think her name was Iris, who was doing these gorgeous sketches and she would print them out on large format sticker paper and like label everything and her her drawing skills and her way of designing stuff was so cool and she came up with this like flippy design uh like a flip book but a machine that was so cool uh and you know people like that were saying that they felt like they had imposter syndrome in this room and, and that really helped explode it for me because like clearly this is just a sort of human thing. And you have to get past that sort of feeling of being unworthy or not be, not having the skills in whatever way because everyone brings their own their own things to it. Um and that's part of the the sharing stuff mentality as well, right? Like if I had been like, "Oh, well, I'm not doing anything super special or this stuff isn't very complicated." or I'm not very good at it, so I shouldn't be sharing this stuff on the internet, um, then I wouldn't be have this... I really love what I'm doing today, uh, and I think it's amazing that I get to do this for my job, and I wouldn't get to do that at all without having just sort of not cared about that at the start, I guess because I didn't think anyone was going to see it, but it worked out. Yeah, keep learning, keep trying, keep sharing. It It works out. I like that. And it has value. Our guest has been Alex Glow, a resident hardware nerd at Hackster.io. You can find her as Glow ASCII, all in word, on most platforms like Twitter and Hackster. Thanks for being with us, Alex. Thanks. And thank both of you. Uh, this is so awesome. I also wanted to point out that ASCII in this case is spelled A-S-C-I-I, like the, uh, the, the, what would you call it? Text protocol? Yeah. I mean, is there any other way to spell ASCII? I don't know, but maybe you don't know the word. <laughs> like if I, I don't know, no, no, before I was totally a huge funny. nerd, I didn't know how to spell that. So, <laughs> but yeah, oh, y'all are so great. They will talk forever. There will be plenty of links in the show notes, including to all of these things. So you can spell ASCII, but also to many of the other things we talked about. I want to thank our patrons for Alex's mic. We really appreciate your support and keeping our podcast sounding good is important to you as well as us. If you'd like to support the show, go to embedded.fm and hit the support us link on the top of bar. Thank you to Christopher for producing and co-hosting and thank you for listening. You can always contact us in the normal ways, such as the contact link on embedded.fm. And now I have a quote to leave you with. From Roald Dahl. Ooh. A person who has good thoughts cannot ever be ugly. You can have a wonky nose and a crooked mouth and a double chin and stick out teeth. But if you have good thoughts, they will shine out of your face like sunbeams and you will always look lovely. Embedded is an independently produced radio show that focuses on the many aspects of engineering. It is a production of Logical Elegance, an embedded software consulting company in California. If there are advertisements in the show, we did not put them there and do not receive money from them. At this time, our sponsors are Logical Elegance and listeners like you.